So here's the deal. My channel focuses primarily on basketball history. Although I occasionally discuss topics related to the modern game, my brand focuses on generations past. Because of this, most of my viewing audience tends to be boomers and Gen Xers. I imagine many of you guys aren't aware of this ongoing narrative on TikTok and Twitter, and sometimes even here on YouTube. Every day, more and more people are beginning to claim that Wilt Chamberlain's 100-point game never happened. As for myself personally, I do believe that this game happened, and I'll explain why in this video. But at the very least, I can understand why there's some recent skepticism from some modern NBA fans. For one, a 100-point game is so far from anything we've ever seen. We saw Kobe give one of the greatest performances of all time when he dropped 81 points in 2006. And even then, he was still a whopping 10 baskets short of eclipsing Wilt's total. The other reason for the skepticism is the fact that none of Wilt's 100-point game was caught on film. We have a box score and some personal testimonies of what his teammates and opponents witnessed, but not a single highlight. This has led some people to believe that the whole thing is simply a made-up fairy tale. Now I'm all for a good conspiracy because newsflash, people lie. And I think it's always good to use critical thinking when you're told to believe something. As for myself personally, I'm obviously not old enough to have lived through that time. Since I was not there on that day, I cannot say beyond a shadow of a doubt that this game actually happened. But, I can at least explain why I believe it did. Here are my 5 reasons why I believe Wilt scored 100 points. Point number 1. 100 points isn't actually as crazy as it sounds. The season that Wilt allegedly scored 100 points, teams were averaging 118.8 points per game. That is literally the highest scoring season of NBA history. Not only did Will average 50 points that season, but Oscar Robertson averaged a 30-point triple-double. And the Lakers' Elgin Baylor averaged 38.3 points per game, which is the highest scoring average by anyone other than Wilt. Simply put, offense was absurdly inflated in 1962, and that's because the pace of play was at a blistering speed. Even without three-point shots, teams were able to produce so much offense, simply because of the sheer amount of possessions that they had. Here's something else to consider. Wilt Chamberlain wasn't scoring that many points in 1962, simply because he was better than everyone else. But it was also because he was playing so much more than everyone else. You see, heading into the 1961 to 1962 season, Frank McGuire had just been hired to be the head coach of the Philadelphia Warriors. According to McGuire, he had a private meeting with Wilt before the season began, and in that meeting, he asked Wilt how many minutes he would like to play per game. And to that, Wilt responded by saying, I never want to go to the bench. As surreal as it sounds by modern day standards, Frank honored that request from Wilt. Other than a game where Chamberlain had been ejected, he played every single minute of every single game in the 1961-62 regular season. Wilt averaged 50.4 points in 1962, but his per 36 minute stats reduced that scoring average to a more comprehensible 37.4. Michael Jordan famously averaged 37.1 points per game in 1987. But the thing is, he only averaged 40 minutes per game. And if you prorate his minutes to 48 per game, then MJ's scoring average increases to 44.5 per game. So just by looking at the minutes and at the stats, you can start to see how Wilt's scoring isn't quite as insane as it sounds on the surface level. Another thing to consider is that Wilt Chamberlain was absurdly hot heading into the 100-point game. It was actually his fourth straight game where he had scored at least 60 points. And in a game just several months earlier, he had scored 78 points. At the time, many writers were starting to speculate that he might eventually score 100 points. So although it was amazing, it wasn't really the most surprising thing to happen in basketball. Now here's the other thing. 
Wilt allegedly scored 100 points against the New York Knicks on March 2, 1962 in Hershey, Pennsylvania. The Knicks were one of the worst teams in the league defensively, as they were allowing roughly 120 points per game. But as bad as the Knicks were on defense, they were even worse the night that Wilt was going up against them. You see, the Knicks' usual starting center that season was a 6'10 player in his sixth year, named Phil Jordan. According to reports, Phil had been out partying the night before and was vomiting prior to tip-off. Because of this, Phil sat out of that game. This means that Wilt was going up against the Knicks' backup center, Daryl Imhoff. Daryl was 6'10", but he was also a skinny second-year player who wasn't accustomed to defending starting centers, let alone Wilt Chamberlain. Seeing how Wilt always played 48 minutes, he was going to be guarded by the backup of the backup. When Daryl Imhoff went to the bench, the player who then had to defend Wilt was a 6'9 rookie forward Cleveland Buckner. So again, when you consider that the Knicks sucked defensively, the starting center was out, and Wilt was spending a large portion of the game up against an undersized rookie who was out of position, then yeah, it's not really surprising that this happened to be the night that he allegedly scored 100 points. Some will say that the craziest and most suspicious part is that he went 28 of 32 from the free throw line. At first glance, yeah, that looks really odd, coming from a player who's a career 51% foul shooter. But here's the thing, bad free throw shooters getting in a good rhythm is not something completely unheard of. Shaq was also one of the worst free throw shooters in NBA history, and in three games of his career, Shaq made at least 12 free throws without missing any. Giannis isn't a tremendous free throw shooter either, yet he's gone 17 of 17 from the line twice in his career. It's also worth mentioning that Wilt was an extremely streaky and inconsistent free throw shooter. Sometimes he would be solid, and sometimes he would be terrible. One season of his career, he shot 38% from the free throw line, and on another, he shot 61%. His inconsistencies were so confusing that he eventually started visiting a therapist to help him with his foul shooting. Knowing this history about Wilt, and knowing that other terrible foul shooters have had amazing nights from the line, it isn't all that shocking that he went 28 of 32 on the best night of his career. So again, this all isn't as crazy as it sounds. So let's press on. Point number two. The game not being filmed was actually quite normal. To put it simply, the NBA was not very popular in the 1960s, Sure, some games were on television, but those were usually NBA playoff games with a tape delay. This game, on the other hand, was just a monotonous regular season matchup involving one decent and one terrible team. Back then, technology was nowhere close to what it is today. Nobody had smartphones, and very few people even had cameras. For the people who had cameras, they weren't usually some small and compact packages back then, but they were actually quite large and expensive, especially when they were filming video. Ask yourself this, how many full-length Wilt Chamberlain games can you find on YouTube that are older than 1967? If you can find any, I'm willing to bet that 99% of them were playoff games. For goodness sake, we don't even have all of Michael Jordan's games on film from his rookie season. Try to find his first regular season game against the Portland Trailblazers. You can't. I know this because I recently made a video about it. And Jordan was a rookie two decades after the 100 game took place. Acting like it's some sort of conspiracy that we don't have the footage of a routine regular season game in 1962 is just silly. Point number three, the era of America they played in. Players like Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain have spoken at length about their experiences as a black player in the NBA in the 1960s. If someone made up a 100 point performance, why would they do that? You're telling me that a league that was owned by white men, with white viewers of the game in the 1960s, lied on behalf of a black man? Yeah, 
I don't see how that makes any sense. Something else to consider is how the NBA would want this game to be on film. What benefit does the league have by not having footage of the greatest scoring performance in its history? Why would they make that up? If anything, they might stage the performance with a scripted outcome. That way, they have it on film to draw interest to the sport. But the fact that they don't have any footage at all probably drives the league office crazy. And I'm sure they wish Kobe's 81 was actually the top scoring performance. That way, they can monetize it and promote it as such. Point number four, the credibility of the eyewitness. According to reports, roughly 4,000 people were in the arena when Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points. But what almost no one ever mentions is the official statistician. This is Harvey Pollock, and he is in the Hall of Fame. Harvey passed in 2015, but before that, he worked as an official NBA statistician for over 60 years. At the time the game took place, Harvey was in the building as the game statistician. He was a writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer and for the Associated Press. He is the one who tracked Wilt's stats, and he's also the one who handed Wilt a piece of paper with 100 written on it. And he's the man behind the camera who snapped the most iconic photo in basketball history. If there is anyone with the credibility to provide a trustworthy box score, it's Harvey Pollock. Point number five, the radio broadcast. A lot of people who claim this never happened because it wasn't on film usually don't know that we actually have the fourth quarter's audio of the radio broadcast. You can listen to snippets of this audio on YouTube where the game is described in detail. Here's an audio clip of the moment Wilt scored 100. 167 to 146. Now let's see if they found somebody quick. Rogers throws long to Chamberlain. He's got it. He's trying to get up. He shoots. No good. The rebound, Luckinbill. Back to Chamberlain. He shoots up. No good. In and out. The rebound, Luckinbill. Back to Ruckwick. Into Chamberlain. This radio broadcast is actually being preserved in the Library of Congress. So again, if this was all a lie, Harvey Pollock was in on it, the thousands of people who were at the game were in on it, the league was in on it, the government is in on it, and they staged a fake radio broadcast just to convince everyone of the lie. Because reasons, I guess. Friends, just admit it. It would make more sense that this game actually happened than it does about it being this big complex lie that involves thousands of separate individuals who are all complicit. So what do you guys think? Are you still skeptical? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comment section below. Thanks for watching as always. Make sure to like and subscribe for more basketball content and I'll see you guys in the next video.